I'm excited to announce that uh, Boyan will be presenting on the six levels of AutoML. Uh, we were talking last night about whether there is anyone who has achieved as highly as him in the three areas in which we rank uh, Kaggle data scientists, so those being competitions, uh, kernels, and discussion. Uh, I think there is not. I think you have truly um, reached the frontier and uh, contributed in a lot of different ways to Kaggle. I like so doing assembling. There we go. So uh, yeah, take it away. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? OK, good. Um, well, thank you, everyone, for coming here. Uh, it's such an honor and pleasure to be at this stage and uh, be presenting in front of all of you. Uh, I've been on Kaggle for three and a half years. It has been definitely a very uh, life-changing, career-changing uh, experience for me. Um, everything you've heard from previous speakers about Kaggle and how great it is in terms of you know, uh, learning, uh, professional development, and all these other things, you know, I, I found myself getting a whiplash from all the nodding that I was doing <laughs> through other things. So yes, it's, it's a just a wonderful uh, platform that I really enjoy, and I'm uh, really excited to be here. So today I'll be talking about six levels of AutoML. Um, the idea for my talk came from uh, six levels of uh, driverless cars or auto autonomous vehicles. Uh, they're trying to kind of define what those levels would be so, so in, on very kind of general high levels. So like, before we begin, I just want to again thank Kaggle and uh, Kaggle Days and Logic AI for organizing these things. Uh, thank Kaggle and uh, Google Cloud for uh, you know hosting the event. I want to thank my employer H2O.AI for both you know keeping me off the street as well as uh, many other great Kagglers, <laughs> as well as you know providing actually very stimulating and very interesting environment to learn more about uh, what autonomous uh, machine learning is all about and kind of give me impetus for a lot of the, the discussion. But you know, I want to reassure all of you, this is not going to be infomercial for H2O. So you know, yeah, I'm just going to keep uh, information just relevant enough to, for uh, the actual uh, talk. Um, I also want to uh, uh, thank you know, several of my colleagues and friends who you know, have taken a look at uh, these uh, six levels earlier or given me some uh, useful information that I've included. Uh, these are you know, Marius Michalidis, also known as Casanova, Erin Liddell, who's our uh, AutoML guru at H2O, uh, Dmitry Larkov for uh, going over some of the uh, information, Peter Herford, who's actually uh, a data robot, but you know, I, I respect his uh, opinion as well, especially because he's a competition. Uh, Carlos Huertas, who also gave very interesting and very uh, valuable information early on, and Olivia Grelia, who's probably seen more of this presentation before the presentation than even I have. Uh, so uh, just want to give you just a general idea about the presentation. It's not going to be, at least from my perspective, it's not going to be very technical, but that doesn't mean it's not going to be very kind of deep and high level uh, presentation. So intended for general audience, and you know, although I know that most of you are not really general, general audience, I hopefully you will be able to appreciate most of this stuff on, a, on its own level. Um, opinions, definitions, all these things, you know, I, I came up on my own, pulled them out of thin air, you know, hopefully they have some resonance with you, but if not, I'm very open to suggestions and improvements on, the, on this thing. Is this is an interesting topic and I think it's on the right and would like to explore it a little bit more uh, as the time goes on. Uh, so here's the overview. Just a general overview of what I'm trying to do, what motivation for this is, uh, how it came up with uh, these definitions, what, what were the criteria I used for, uh, for coming up with them. Uh, I'll just briefly go on these six levels of ca uh, car automation that are very popular in the literature. You know, automated cars, self-driving cars are very popular. It's, it's a big thing. But you know, being a Kaggler, being a machine learning practitioner, I think automating machine learning is even cooler than that. So like, I'm really happy to be working on that right now or thinking along those lines. Um, the analogy is like not really perfect because even you know, deciding what is the car, what is the destination, what are all these things, in the context of machine learning is not easy, not really trivial. So like the analogy is more kind of on a higher level conceptual that we would have to different levels of automation. Uh, I will also not be bogged down too much with the technical details. A lot of comparison between different uh, machine learning, automated machine learning approaches focus on one feature or another feature. Uh, although they, it, the feature itself may be technically challenging, it does not necessarily imply a higher level of uh, automated machine learning. Um, I'll think about like how feasible it would be to have a fully automated auto, uh, machine learning. Is it something that we can even 
you know, achieve or it would be a desirable thing and what would be kind of side effects of having something like that uh, available. Uh, that I'll conclude with a few uh, remarks and of course I'm gonna have open this all uh, to questions. So what is AutoML? So before we begin, I want to reassure everyone, AutoML is not ML for auto. So like I'm gonna take like three second pause here for all of you who think you are in a wrong room, you know, you can leave and then I'll continue with, comp <laughs> all right, all right. So most of you seem to know what you're uh, go getting yourself into. Um, so automated machine learning is process of applying automation to end-to-end -end, uh, process of uh, 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 automation and the process of applying machine learning to real world problems. So like uh, one of the important distinction is, you know, we are working for, with real world problems. We're not trying to uh, come up with absolute uh, automated system for any kind of machine learning problems. This is, you know, partly motivated by practical concerns, but partly also motivated how all of this came about. Uh, you know, most of the Kaggle problems are very much applied real world problems, even <laughs> when they are sent tender problems, so we have absolutely no idea what we're talking about. But you know, in some uh, very remote way, we know they have some kind of relevance to the real world. So that really constrains kind of problems we can work on, and this constraint is uh, something that we can leverage to actually come up with a much more, um, probably much more uh, feasible uh, automation of machine learning. Uh, so the whole question, what is auto? Is it autonomous, or automated, or automatic? So, you know, we have different definitions for these things. They sort of relate to each other, but, you know, I, I don't want to kind of get bogged down to these uh, details because even people, when they apply them to uh, cars and you know, automated vehicles, don't really, you know, get hang up too much on these things. It's essentially seen means something that does something by itself. So that's pretty much what all that I really mean by auto ML. So it's pretty kind of self-understanding. Um, and uh, at one point, I actually wanted to take a look at, at uh, word embeddings for these uh, different words and see you know, how they co correlate. But you know, I was running late with the presentation. I was like, ah, too much work. So you're not going to get that in this presentation. Um, uh, another thing that I want to kind of uh, point out is I will be just focusing for purposes of this presentation for very short, small sliver of uh, what a typical data science pipeline looks like. So I will be mostly working with uh, modeling and re slightly uh, related things to the left and right. You know, we all know that, you know, m uh, machine learning m engineers and practitioners spent a majority of their time cleaning data, coming up with uh, uh, validation schemes, coming up with uh, business justification, so all sorts of other things that are not really part of this modeling process for machine learning. So again, uh, this additional constraint makes it possible to think much more aggressively of, uh, about the possibility of having fully automated uh, machine learning stack. Um, so why, why would we want to have AutoML? You know, especially if you're pretty good yourself and most people in this room are pretty good uh, at machine learning, why would you actually want to kind of automate something that you're good at? Um, well, you know, because we like to use ML to automate things, you know, a very natural thing would be to automate the ML itself. So it's, it's intellectually, it's very, people who are curious about applying automation to things would you know, eventually stumble upon this in its own right, so it's very curious uh, things to take a look at. You know, like uh, 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 Kiri was uh, looking at uh, you know, automating uh, detection of different paintings or something like that. So it's like, hmm, that seems like an interesting problem. So like, you, you just kind of, cur out of curiosity, people would eventually have stumbled on it. But it really has much more application than that. Uh, it autom automating, uh, automatically <laughs> means, no pun intended, uh, that you want to uh, have some kind of consistency about how you apply machine learning. You know, it may, may or may not be the best thing to have a consistency, you know, because if, if you come across a problem that you've never seen before, it may not actually be able to actually recognize it, but it really kind of helps problems scale and be efficient for a much wider, you know, uh, uh, set of problems. Um, it makes it more accessible. So one of the things that, uh, both Kaggle and data science community are very good about is uh, making things accessible to wide variety of audiences, wide variety of business users, wide variety of uh, all sorts of other practitioners. Um, and for Kagglers, of course, um, competitions are getting more and more intense. There's more people entering every time. Uh, we, we can't really just kind of throw in the last minute a few of our scripts and then hope to actually do well. We actually really have to Think, uh, think hard about having m much more consistent pipeline that we can hopefully re re repurpose for different problems. Um, so from industry perspective, 
um, there's increased demand for data science and machine learning uh, applications. Uh, pretty much every day you open uh, any kind of newspaper or magazine, you see something new that's going on where a uh, machine learning is being applied to novel problems. Uh, there's a you know, business uh, pressure to actually uh, apply more of these uh, machine learning problems. But unfortunately, uh, there's a relative shortage of people with relevant skills. So um, one you know, solution would be to actually have uh, a, a solution and application that can actually take off some of the pressure from you know, having to you know, train more people on a very short uh, period of time to do some very hard problems. Uh, or sometimes you, know, you just want to try you know, using machine learning on a very particular problem before you come committing uh, more resources to it. Uh, but you don't really have necessarily have people in the organization who, who have the a relevant uh, background. And you know, something that can be easily applied without really learning too much about a new skill uh, would be actually a very useful uh, thing to have. Um, then, you know, known practitioners, people who are far removed for data science or machine learning or software engineering, who we still would appreciate having some of this stuff in, in their pipeline, could really use uh, something that's automated, uh, something that, that doesn't require them to, to acquire high level uh, uh, skill sets. And then, oh, sorry. And then it can be, uh, be a potentially a big save, uh, money saver. It, if you just need a, a machine learning occasionally or sporadically, but uh, don't really need to invest a whole data science team, you can have something that's automated machine learning that can be incorporated with the rest of your uh, business process or uh, company solutions. Um, then it, it helps faster iterations. Uh, you can, uh, if you have something that's automated, you can experiment more. Uh, you can you know, try something, you know, a few hours later you have a solution that otherwise would take you weeks to implement, and you say, okay, this is not a really good idea, let me try something else. Um, and then this is one of my uh, favorite catchphrases, putting science back into uh, data science. It's, it's uh, very, you know, like I have a lot of respect for people who come from an engineering background who still dominate uh, the field of machine learning, but m most of us who come uh, from a science background can sometimes be frustrated by uh, kind of uh, uh, expectations and, and uh, constraints that, you know, that are mo not more natural for engineering uh, settings, but not really translate well when you have uh, unstructured data or data that doesn't have really any, anything that's very easily uh, understandable and actionable upon. So like, you know, part of the, the whole scientific method is like, you get a data set, you, if, if, uh, if you, <laughs> It, you either know what to do with it or you don't, and if you don't, then it is science. So that's what science is all about, doing, trying something new that you haven't done before. If you've done it before, it's really not science. It's like becomes part of a uh, parcel of other disciplines. Uh, um, carries. Oh, so Kaggle is getting very competitive. You know, every month I feel that you know, there's a new competition, there's the thousands of new people who come all of, all of, out, of uh, out of nowhere, and you know, they bring a lot of more information that uh, uh, I thought I had when I first joined, and it's getting harder and harder to actually get um, really good at the uh, Kaggle competition. Uh, it has a very wide international reach. So if, you know, when I first joined, I think about a third of top 100 uh, were from the US. I think now it's probably one in 10 or one in, uh, in a eight. So you know, it, it's become much more internationally spread out. So you, with that reach, you know, people from various different backgrounds come into play. And then <laughs> we have younger and younger people, and young people are full of energy, have a lot of new ideas that, that, that's, uh, uh, that can bring to the table, and you know, they're fast learners, and they can move really fast, and you're like, okay, I, I just thought that I was using something last week that was cutting edge, now they're coming with something that's even more cutting edge. So like one example, you know, there's my son, he <laughs> picked up a book on uh, uh, neural networks a couple of weeks ago, he entered uh, Titanic a week later, and these days he's working Sci-Fi 10, and he's pretty much reading the benchmarks. So you know, it's getting really, really hard to actually keep ahead of the pack. Uh, so, so what are the six levels of car aut autonomy? Uh, first one is essentially it's a, uh, most places have it uh, zero autonomy, which means that our car is just doing a very limited amount of uh, corrections, uh, signaling what needs to be done. Um, level one, uh, car and in the, in the driver share, you know, system at some point. Um, 
level two is when you can take your hands off of the wheel. So, so you know, automated system uh, uh, for accelerating, braking, and steering. Uh, level three is when you can take eyes off, so you can actually do texting. I know a lot of people are doing it even without <laughs> this level of autonomy, which I would not recommend. But you know, if you could actually do it legally and without any repercussions, it would be a good thing. Uh, except that people then would find even more dumb things to do during their rides. But you know, it's it's an it's a arms race. Um, mind off is that you can pretty much go to sleep while you're driving, and that would be uh, again for various reasons more desirable thing to have. And finally, you have a steering wheel optional level where you don't really have to have a human in the car at all. So like a robot taxi would be an example of that. So this is, uh, you know, people have different formulation of these the six levels, but this is general overview, or general kind of um, where the different levels of autonomy, and you can see like uh, how progressively uh, you have to have a less of a human influence. And that's sort of a motivation how I came up with uh, uh, levels of uh, AutoML. So the, here are the levels. So level zero is no automation. You bring your own code. You code your algorithms in things like C++, the way Mikhail Yara would. And if you don't know who Mikhail Yara is, uh, he's a Netflix Prize winner who's uh, come up with some most amazing solutions in uh, Kaggle's uh, competitions. And I had a distinct privilege of uh, teaming up with him for one of the competitions that we won. And, and it's a completely different experience. You know, I've actually seen his C++ code. I have no idea what it does, but I know it works <laughs> because, hey, we won competitions using part of that stuff. So it's, it's amazing. Um, so here comes level one. And I really credit level one with the fact that uh, Kaggle has exploded as much as it has. We, we finally have all sorts of uh, nicely uh, packaged uh, uh, high-level uh, uh, machine learning packages like sklearn, Keras, Pandas, H H2O, HGBoost. Uh, they can, you know, you, you can come in there. There's a data set. You know how to you know, fit the data set with uh, just one of these algorithms and then apply it to something else. And like, you can actually quickly iterate and actually people with very limited uh, coding background can quickly become uh, fairly proficient using this stuff. Um, that's the reason I was able to get as far as I could. You know, if I had to do it from level zero, I never would have gotten into machine learning. Um, level two, um, this is where you know, more advanced uh, uh, things come in play by uh, automatic hyperparameter tuning, assembling, uh, and some basic model selection. You know, many people have uh, gone over some of these topics, so I'm not going to go into great details. But this is, you know, some of the packages you have, like Bayesian optimization or uh, Hyperopt. Uh, some of these Python packages can only do some of this stuff. So it's only a little bit more advanced. And uh, as everyone knows, uh, all Kaggle uh, competitions are won by biggest ensembles. So you know, being able to ensemble these things, uh, it's really helpful. Uh, Level three, and this is pretty much where we are at right now. Like state of the art, I, I would argue would be level three, where you have some automatic feature engineering and feature selection, uh, technical uh, uh, augmentation, and graphical user interface. You know, again, I think uh, graphical user interface can be another major uh, uh, leap forward. It's as much of a leap from zero to one, zero to one as it's one to three, for instance, in terms of like making machine learning more accessible and more uh, widely uh, used. Now comes level four, which is something that we still haven't gotten to. Um, so a lot of times, uh, good feature engineering really relies on understanding a little bit more about uh, meaning of the data. So uh, you need to have some domain specific, a domain uh, uh, particular expertise or understanding of the, what the domain is. And sometimes it can be just you know, understanding how humans think. That, that's pretty much all that it sometimes requires. It doesn't have to be like PhD in uh, statistical physics, no offense, uh, you know, <laughs> that to understand how to apply a problem to some kind of very specific case. Um, data augmentation, uh, uh, again, technical data augmentation applies very, very set number of uh, technical tools to the pretty much any uh, data set. But here, we can actually f uh, have much more thoughtful uh, uh, kind of imputation of uh, what the data is. Uh, and uh, for instance, uh, one thought that I thought is like uh, when Kiro, Kiro was presenting those different paintings from different uh, times, uh, 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 
time here is you can actually maybe augment them by placing items in those paintings that would have been consistent with the time, uh, time era, but would otherwise uh, not be known to, to a, a general purpose machine learning system. Um, and then comes full uh, ML automation. And this is where things kind of really kind of go haywire. We have actually not, don't really know how even get, get there. So I'll be trying to sort of come up with some ideas of what it may mean, what it uh, would actually entail. So it would be uh, something that would be superhuman in terms of the strategies to solve some problems. Uh, analogy would be more to like how we learn to, uh, we, uh, machines learn how to play chess and go to, to come up with something that really kind of blows us away in terms of like what kind of strategies they can come up with. Um, another thing that would be very desirable for those kind of systems would be truly uh, uh, interactional uh, ability to, to interact with, uh, with the system on a human level uh, language. So it, it, again, it's not a full Turing test. This is not a, a full uh, a general uh, artificial intelligence. It's just a very specific to the, uh, the, the world of machine learning, how we think about it, how we can approach uh, uh, these, these kind of problems. So is full ML even possible? So we know, all know about uh, no lunch theorem uh, that uh, you, know, you can never come up with a, a strategy for finding ML solutions that would be ap applicable to every situation. And uh, my answer to this, uh, the real world problems, which again is what we talked about in introduction, you know, is a highly constrained. It does, is, you're not going to have any distribution of values that you can possibly have. You know, you have business problems, you have image problems that are uh, interesting to humans, you have uh, audio problems that are interesting to humans. So all these, all these things will somehow constrain the uh, set of problems to something that potentially uh, can be amenable to uh, automation. Um, and then his, this is a, a definition of what that uh, uh, AutoML would be like, and th this is the first time I've probably introduced to the wider audience. Uh, I call it a uh, Kaggle optimal solution. So you take a problem, you throw it on Kaggle, and you have people who are Kagglers come up with a solution within two or three months, and that would be optimal solution for that particular machine learning problem. So that's, uh, again, uh, Fairly abstract, but yet I think very uh, easy to understand what something like uh, fully automated uh, would mean. Um, and superhuman AutoML would essentially be able to beat uh, top Kagglers almost every time. And I say almost because we all know about uh, uh, leakages and we know all, all sorts of other things that plague some of the Kaggle competitions. So they would, it, there's still uh, quite a bit of randomness involve, involved in a winning Kaggle competition. So how did I decide of these things? Well, you know, I just uh, sat down one day and just scribbled whatever came to my mind. No. Um, machine learning is mostly driven by practitioners. You know, there's been a lot of talk in earlier uh, talks about how a state of the art applied machine learning, you know, keeps advancing much faster than, you know, literature or definitely academia are able to keep, uh, keep up with the pace with. So practitioners are people who just go there and do something and try to come up with a, a new, new ways of doing it. And I, I, I use analogies with how electrical engineering was in 1880s or 1890s. Uh, by the way, that's before I was born, just to clarify. So I was not there. Um, or computer science in 1980s, which was barely around time when I was uh, uh, around. So it, you, know, you had a lot of bright people, with tools that uh, became very accessible. You could just go, go into a garage and tinker with things and come up with some amazing things. And this is one of the uh, most exciting things about machine learning right now. I feel like I'm, I'm living again through, uh, through one of these very interesting eras. And you know, I, I'm, you know, every day like I, I can't believe that you know, on my little desk of a workstation I, I can come up with these state-of-the-art things that you know, best companies in the world cannot come up with. So it's like really exciting. Um, so I was, you know, what, what, what I'm looking at is like, you know, what do practitioners of machine learning do? And what, what parts of their process are the, the hard on different levels. So like you, you, you have a stuff that's uh, uh, technically easy to execute and relatively straightforward. So that's you know, very easy, easy stuff. You have stuff that's tef technically difficult to execute, but it's relatively uh, straightforward to understand what's going on. Like you know, so it does require a lot of computation, for instance. But you know, you know what you're doing. And then you have technically difficult stuff that's not so straightforward but it's still feasible within, within our ability to kind of reason about. And then there's the parts that we can't even you know, technically formulate, let alone kind of come up with the solutions to. So these are broad criteria that I use in the defining what, uh, how I would go. So one example of uh, 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 
technically diff uh, difficult, but uh, uh, otherwise very straightforward, would be uh, uh, a neural architecture search. So this is a search for different uh, art neural architectures. It took uh, uh, companies thousands of hours of uh, compute time to come up with these optimal solutions. But you know, like you, you have your search pace, you have your optimization method, and you have your uh, evaluation uh, method. So these things are very straightforward from the uh, high level understanding of what, what you were doing. So it, it's, it's impressive, like technically impressive, but not necessarily impressive from the, you know, like what we can uh, actually uh, understand about these things. So here's again, going through each one of these levels on its own. No automation means uh, implementing ML algorithm from scratch. It requires fairly high level of uh, software engineering, and which is you know, why most of the uh, practitioners up to now have been uh, software engineers. Um, and it, most of the uh, workflow really focused more on writing tools and uh, you know, good practices and coding, which you know, it's very good stuff. But you know, it's very hard to scale, and it's not very easy to understand. So here was, you know, I just randomly Googled you know, C, uh, logistic regression in C++. If anyone, you know, <laughs> uh, has any understanding what's going on there, more power to you. I, I'm completely lost. It seems like, all right, you know, that's nice C++ code. Um, so this is you know, how Kaggle in the early days was like. You know, you, you know, sat around uh, your cave and practice building tools. Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, you know, it, it was brutal, you know, all against all kind of world. It's, you know, people didn't last long back in the day. I know. You know, Dimitri was back there. You know, he actually recognized himself in one of the pictures. <laughs> um, but you know, uh, writing things from scratch is not all that bad. And I think actually, once you get a little bit good at, at uh, uh, data science and machine learning, you should try to implement some of these uh, algorithms. Hopefully, not in C++, but something like Python. Uh, and this is a pretty good book. I haven't gone through all of it, but it has a lot of examples of uh, how to do data science from scratch. It would give you better understanding. And at some level, that better understanding can actually translate into being a better machine learning modeler. So now we're at uh, level one, and we have all sorts of wonderful packages and tools. For instance, uh, uh, we have all these machine learning libraries, like sklearn, pandas, xgboost, whatnot. Um, they allow novices to you know, come to the teams quickly, iterate, you know, and pr probably get uh, better with, with time. Um, it standardizes the uh, framework, so for instance, AP, uh, the sklearn API can be you know, put together with many different packages, so you can have a very easy kind of to build uh, data flow that you can uh, bring different uh, tools from different uh, um, places and put them all together in something that can be pretty powerful and pretty amazing in terms of their, uh, its performance. Um, so here, you, know, you remember that C++ code that I showed you, <laughs> this is equivalent in Python these days, so you know, it, it's, I would argue this is a step in the right direction for you know, democratizing and you know, making uh, things more accessible. Um, now, if, next would be uh, level two. Some would consider this to be real true uh, AutoML, uh, but you know, like, uh, just like with cars, what for one generation is automatic, for the next generation is just uh, zero automation, so like we all talk uh, you know, in our parents' generation, people were talking about stick shift and automatic transmission, and that was level one automation. Now no one thinks of that as automatic at all. So, you know, things change with time. We get used to something being automated, and then it becomes kind of phase in the background and becomes part of uh, what we take for granted. Uh, uh, so that this would be, you give a system data set, you specify the target, and let it create a whole bunch of algorithms uh, in, uh, in, uh, that can predict on a new data set. Um, it has aut automation for like a uh, validation strategy, usually just a CV or like a train validation set split. Um, the AutoML chooses the best set of high parameters and models, and so these are the very straightforward things that this uh, system would do. Um, it also performs some basic sampling, you know, either by blending things using uh, different weights or uh, basic stacking, for instance. So these are very straightforward, very easy to understand. So for hyperparameter optimization, it uses usually two or three different techniques, like a grid search, where you have a grid of different hyperparameters that you try your algorithm on. Uh, it uses a random search, where it's more random, and you know, it also uses Bayesian search. So these would be sort of illustrations of the three. 
So for grid search, you try almost every parameter in some kind of uh, equally spaced uh, uh, distance. Uh, it's very you know, resource and time in, uh, uh, expensive. Uh, if you do a random uh, search, it actually a lot of times outperforms grid search at much uh, uh, shorter times. And based on optimization, it actually is like random search, but only uh, uses a, a subset of values based on best prediction of what the, the next best uh, uh, place in a, a, a hyperparameter space would be like. Um, for ensembling, uh, technically, some of these uh, level one uh, algorithms like XGBoost and uh, Random Forest are all the ensembles of algorithms, but we use them as uh, level one algorithms, so you would actually have to be something more than that. Um, so being using the single mo models. Um, so here, there's a few you know, examples. There's blending, which is just fine. You know, I, again, there's a lot of uh, difference in how people label these things. For me, blending is just finding some uh, simple weights. Boosting actually tries to you know, improve on this by iteratively coming up with different weights. Uh, and then everyone's favorite, stacking, where you create a k-fold split of your data and uh, uh, make predictions out of fold and use those predictions as a meta features for your next level uh, algorithm. So these are main three things. And here's, for instance, <laughs> one uh, monster ensemble that I use to predict the differences uh, between cats and dogs. So <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. Um, so there's a lot of different base models, a lot of different uh, ways to uh, make level one or level two or even three uh, ways of, of assembling them. But this kind of uh, setup is very typical for your Kaggle competition. It's uh, probably not even the most uh, 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 crazy thing that you, you'll see, not by a long shot. Um, now we come to level three, where we have a technical feature engineering and uh, feature selection and a few other things that I'll talk about. Um, so we have automatic technical feature engineering, um, technical feature selection, meaning very specific uh, set of uh, transformations that you do, and uh, technical data augmentation, and we finally have GUI. Uh, we finally can get uh, people to interact with uh, machine learning, uh, automated machine learning uh, environment in the way that they interact with each other, or, uh, well, not quite with each other, but the way you interact with, you know, your toaster, for instance. Um, so what's uh, te automatic technical feature engineering? It's, uh, you have different encodings of your data, uh, and there were very good presentations earlier. Uh, Carlos had uh, one good example of what these would be. Uh, Dimitri had a whole uh, session on these things. Uh, so you, you have some very specific set of uh, different encodings, like one-hot encodings, label encoding, frequency encoding, uh, target encodings. Then you have different encodings for numerical data. You could do some binning and make them into categorical data, or you can do some kind of monotonic uh, uh, mathematical transformations. Um, you do aggregations if you don't have, um, if you have certain features at different levels. And then you have, uh, you can make some kind of interaction features. Um, some difference, product, quotient, those are the most popular ones, but can be more complicated than that. And again, this is just scratching the surface of all possible transformation that you can have. Um, then for uh, uh, text, you can have word embeddings, and for uh, images, you have a pre-trained image net that you can uh, extract features out of and then use with the rest of your pipeline. Um, for feature selection, we, we build some model, uh, look at the feature importances, and you know, try to get uh, the most important ones uh, 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 selected. Uh, again, Carlos did a very good presentation about some of these techniques. A uh, few examples would be for feature selection, recursive feature elimination, uh, permutation impact. Uh, but you know, the problem with these uh, methods, you know, when you start creating all these extra features, you, know, you, you do have some kind of combinatorial explosion and you get very quickly overwhelmed with how many features you can generate. So you have to have a little bit more uh, thoughtful uh, uh, selection of features and that's where genetic programming, for instance, come into play. Um, so what's technical or data documentation? Um, for instance, one thing would be add stock value prices to temporal data. If you have uh, some kind of uh, business problem over several years and you're trying to solve for something related to that business, uh, you could take the temporal data, uh, 
add an extra feature, to, you know, closing price of uh, stock market that they, that they that could be easily done for that kind of problem. Again, very straightforward. Um, geographical feature information uh, for problems that have some kind of uh, geographical uh, relevance. Again, you have a business, you know, trying to predict sales, uh, some kind of ge geographical information, how far they located, the business is located from a, a city center or from the capital of the state or things like that could be easily kind of added to those things. Um, for uh, credit scoring, FICO uh, uh, score could be a uh, simple thing to add. Well, technically simple. <laughs> um, then this, this is a trick that has become popular on Kaggle for NLP problems. Uh, NLP problems are a little bit tricky to do technical uh, data augmentation, uh, but we discovered a trick where you, you take some kind of uh, a translation tool, you try to say like your know, corpus is in, in uh, English, you translate into Russian, and then you translate back into English, and it turns out uh, that actually, if you build models with that, can actually give you a, a quite a noticeable uh, improvement. Well, noticeable from a Kaggle standpoint, not uh, maybe a real world, but it's, it's, a, it's a trick where you can have a straightforward technical feature augmentation for NLP data. Um, then you can inject various noise, for instance, in sound and image data, or you can use the various transformation for those things, time translation, rotation, Known some non-homogeneous transformation. So these are all very straightforward, technical, well-defined set of uh, feature transformation. Um, including uh, for images, you have blurring, brightening, color saturation, and other you know nice ways of uh, playing the data. Um, GUI, why GUI? Well, it, again, it facilitates interaction with software. You can uh, easily uh, get back and forth uh, uh, in terms of uh, implementing things, trying things. You know, you don't have to code. You can just kind of put some dials, press some buttons, and you have different uh, settings that you could uh, use. Um, it also allows for many non-technical people to use it. So if you're a marketer, uh, uh, advertising business, or doing something else, uh, you can actually try using uh, some of these uh, tools without really needing to invest in, in uh, uh, learning how to code. For instance, uh, think of Photoshop, for instance. All of a sudden, like people who are artists don't have to, like, learn how to code uh, uh, computer graphics, they can start using it, you know, create some amazing uh, work for that. It again further facilitates iteration development. Um, so now we're getting to level four, which is something that we would like to get to next, but it's not there yet. Um, so in, one of the big things, and there are several nice com uh, Kaggle competition, is where you have different data uh, across different tables. So combining those tables into one is a very, difficult process and does require a little bit more understanding what you're doing and how to actually do these things. Um, you need some advanced hyperparameter tuning. The hyperparameter tuning up to this point is okay, uh, but you know, like a lot of calculators can do better, like just by doing some of their own, uh, own tricks. Um, then you have domain and uh, uh, problem specific feature engineering, data augmentation, data integration. So it, you have uh, problem that that uh, you understand, but you know there's no ready-made uh, solution how to actually add additional data to it. But you can actually maybe Google for something, uh, figure out on your own all these tricks that, uh, for instance, people in Zilla were mentioning earlier that people that they had to fend against. Uh, so you know, for uh, combining several different sources, we would like to be able to join tables. Uh, understand which merges would make sense, understand which aggregations would make sense. All of these things are very difficult and you know, just doing all of them at the same time is technically impossible to pull off right now. Um, for advanced hyperparameter tuning, um, manual hyperparameter tuning is still my number one approach and so for many uh, Kagglers, we sort of have intuitions about the data set. We can uh, quickly uh, iterate through the different uh, uh, a set of hyperparameter, uh, hyperparameters, we know where to look. We can understand like, if certain uh, uh, tuning doesn't work, why it's not working, what, what, what to try next. So we can, we have more intuition about it, again, because we've tried uh, uh, doing hyperparameters for many different competitions. So we build a, a repository of uh, kind of knowledge that we can tap into. So it would require deeper understanding of the data and some kind of intuition. And that usually would mean, in context of machine learning, um, some higher level transfer learning. So like you, you build a system that has uh, tuned hyperparameters for many different competitions, and now it has some kind of uh, uh, intuitive sense of like where to look for the next one. 
Um, so you know, it, it may re require some kind of transfer learning, uh, learning from experience. Uh, so what would be specific feature engineering? So features uh, based on understanding of a specific problem or, or why this problem is uh, relevant. Uh, ability to get additional data based on those problems and integrate into the machine learning pipeline. So like you would uh, be able to essentially do a Google search for data set that would be relevant for your information or have information already in, in your expertise that you could be able to tap in by understanding what the problem is all about. We're not there yet. Um, now we come to level five, which is full ML automation. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it would be ability to come up with superhuman uh, strategy for solving hard ML problems without any input or guidance. Um, and it would require like fully conversational interaction with the human user. So these would be ideals for what fully automated uh, uh, machine learning uh, system would be like. Um, so now how do we get there? So up to level four, most of the, if not all of the automation has been essentially hard coded. You, you have engineers, you have Kaggle's, you have people who understand machine learning and they are able to kind of translate those skills or translate the, the the code into something that can be, you know, hard coded into an environment that that uh, that you're trying to build. Um, so to go beyond that, I propose, you know, again, you know, this is just my intuition. This is my uh, uh, understanding of how this hard, hardest problem is to actually use ML approach. So using machine learning to teach auto ML system how to do machine learning. So uh, for level five, we may need to advance tra transfer learning and unsupervised approaches. So ML for ML for ML. So this is uh, what level five may mean. So you use machine learning to teach machine learning system how to do machine learning. Um, in principle, the idea is simple. Give the ML system a large collection of ML problems and their solution and let it learn how to build ML systems. The problem with that is like, uh, like everything else, machine learning, you really need a lot of data. You need a lot of uh, data sets, like you would probably need thousands, for, even for the simplest machine learning problem, you need thousands of instances and we don't have thousands of instances of how good the uh, machine learning problem uh, was uh, formulated. Uh, Kaggle is getting there, but you know, they're not quite there yet. So it's, you know, they're quite quietly working on this, uh, how to acquire as many uh, data sets on uh, doing machine learning as possible. Um, however, you know, there might be still a hope because we don't need to build everything from scratch. We can uh, somehow piggyback on the previous solution that we built uh, do something with those solutions and, uh, and see how we can actually kind of boost ourselves uh, through this process. So what does it mean? Um, so use of unsupervised technique. If you know well enough how parameterize the universe of human relevant problems, we might be able to find some patterns in the data set itself. So like we don't need to really know how to solve the best problems. We can actually find subsets of problems and then like on top of that build some kind of more supervised machine learning problem. Um, Reinforcement learning. Uh, building ML solutions and based on how well they perform, adjust their architecture. So this would be try to teach uh, uh, machine learning problems on top of uh, other machine learning problems. And then of course, other serial auto ML. Have auto ML system compete against each other and make Kaggle competition that's open only to auto ML systems. Iterate. Uh, that might be, uh, something that's beyond what we are capable of doing now, but I think that might be the way to kind of go because this is essentially how uh, AlphaGo and AlphaZero eventually became the most uh, advanced uh, um, uh, Go player and the, and the chess player. So it might be down the road. So uh, fully conversational interaction with human users will further democratize and make ML accessible to a wider audience. This is one of the motivations behind ML and I think this would be very important to, uh, to use. Um, so you know, being able to kind of formulate questions and ask the ML system to actually solve them would be very desirable. Now, uh, AutoML is not all peaches and roses. You know, the potential downsides you know, may lead to some lazy practices in how we, we, when we started uh, relying too much on automation. Um, when models fails, we don't really understand what's going on, at least not in the same way that when we actually build it uh, ourselves. Um, it could have a big societal impact. You know, everyone's talking about uh, automation and uh, uh, job shifting because of uh, advances in machine learning. You know, 
uh, I'm more optimistic than most people are, are about these things, but there are def definitely considerations we you should have. Um, it's very resource in, 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 intensive. So like, you know, amount of uh, compute that you need to actually ex execute these things uh, can be daunting. Uh, I, I can implement uh, uh, H2O's AutoML library in uh, uh, Kaggle kernels, and you know, it, it, even with all the GPUs and, and nine hours running, it can, it can make possible uh, good results, but nothing that you, know, you could otherwise have. And then you, driverless AI needs uh, more advanced uh, systems. Um, and uh, of course, there are some bad actors that we can actually have. So this is a visual kind of uh, hierarchy of how I envision these things. Uh, again, it's uh, uh, nothing more than uh, just uh, a meme. And uh, that pretty much concludes my thing, and I am open to just a couple of questions if you have any. Thank you.